I'm Alan Mortis, and this is Think Radio Presents Think Planet. My guest today is Michael Kotis, award-winning photojournalist, author, and videographer. Society likes to think of uh, the kind of wildfires that we're seeing in California right now as natural disasters. And uh, after the you know seven or eight years that I worked on this book, I kind of came to the conclusion that the wildfires that we see that are disasters actually have very little natural about them. Welcome to another great conversation on Think Radio. Think Planet is made possible by support from the Western Colorado University School of Environment and Sustainability, empowering future change agents to foster ecologically resilient, economically sustainable, and socially just communities throughout the world. If you like Think Planet, then I know you'll enjoy the other shows in the Think Radio Presents family of podcasts. Think People, a celebration of just how amazing people can be. Think Business, a weekly discussion with entrepreneurs, innovators, and disruptors on sustainable business into the 21st century. Subscribe to Think Radio Presents on iTunes, YouTube, or wherever else you get great content. And don't forget to help us spread the word by liking our social media channels and sharing the content we post. We're grateful to have you in the conversation on Think Radio Presents. CODIS is an award-winning photojournalist, author, and videographer. He's also deputy director of the Center for Environmental Journalism at the University of Colorado and has spent three decades as a photojournalist, reporter, author, maker of media on a lot of important topics. In 1999, he was part of a team of journalists that won the Pulitzer Prize for breaking news coverage. In 2008, he authored a book called High Crimes, The Fate of Everest in an Age of Greed. It's a book that looks at the dark side of adventure sports in the Himalaya. It also has the distinction of having been chosen as a question on the game show uh, Jeopardy, which is not something that all authors can say. And last year, CODIS published, published Megafire, The Race to Extinguish a Deadly Epidemic of Flame, about the prevalence of wildfire, not just across the Mountain West, which we hear most about in the news these days, but really all around the world. That book won the Colorado Book Award for general nonfiction. Michael, thanks for dropping by today. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to this conversation. As I alluded to, uh, fire is something that's really on everyone's mind. I mean, as we record this, California is in the, in the midst of yet another historic blaze. Um, just within the last couple of weeks, we released a conversation with Dr. Paul Hesburgh and his work at the U.S. Forest Service around the concept of megafire. I really don't want to talk about that in depth today, uh, but I do want to start there because this is one of the most clear-cut um, pieces of evidence that we can point to today that things really are changing in our world. In fact, as some observers have suggested that the last couple of years really may mark a turning point in the history of our understanding of climate change and other um, man-made changes on the landscape. What's your opinion of that? Do you think that what we're seeing now in the news and in, everywhere in the world uh, surrounding wildfire marks sort of a, a watershed moment? Um, I hope so, at least as far as understanding goes. Uh, I've covered wildfire for decades and worked on this book for quite some time. But one reason that I really wanted to focus on this phenomenon of megafire and the fact that we are seeing so many more large wildfires and we're seeing such a, an exponential increase in the destructiveness and, and deaths from, from wildfires is that wildfire as a, a phenomenon related to climate and climate change is is dramatic and fast and and really captures people's attention it's highly visible it's highly visible it, you know it's happening right now it's it, you know it, you know if you live near one it's an imminent threat whereas many of the impacts of climate change and some of them will probably be 
more costly and more destructive in the long term, say sea level rise Mm -hmm. um, and ocean acidification, are very slow. And it's hard to convince people that the fact that, you know, the water is an inch higher this year than it was last year is something to be really, really worried about. Right. Whereas the huge flames from this fire ripping towards a community, people pay attention to. And so that was one aspect that I wanted to focus on in my book. And I, and I have a whole section of the book that, that deals with the connections between climate and, and our, our wildfire crisis. Um, the reality of our wildfire crisis is climate is part of the problem, but it's only part. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it's a very significant part. It's a big part. But, you know, there are other issues related to development and forest management and economics and politics that that play into this as well. Um, what I really was trying to accomplish in looking at all of these issues is that um, society likes to think of uh, the kind of wildfires that we're seeing in California right now as natural disasters. And uh, after the you know seven or eight years that I worked on this book, I kind of came to the conclusion that the wildfires that we see that are disasters actually have very little natural about them. They're usually yeah. reflections of political, uh, uh, cultural, economic decisions that we've made as societies, and climate is part of that. We've well, made a decision uh, as to the fuels that we're going to use. As if just simply labeling it a natural disaster simplifies things down. It, nothing is that simple, uh, certainly on a landscape scale like this. Um, and yet, some of those other issues, those other uh, categories that you point to, politics, economics, uh, land management, and so forth, those have been around for a long time. Those things have been developing over a number of decades. Do you think climate change is the factor among the four that is the game changer now? That has sort of hit the accelerator on some problems that were have been developing for a century or so? I think the two things, I, I think two real things have hit the accelerator, uh, uh, as you refer to it. And what we've really got are are two of these phenomena that are racing at each other, um, uh, you know, kind of headed for a head-on collision. And so one is definitely climate change. And, you know, if you uh, cover uh, climate change and produce a lot of journalism about it, like I have, um, then you probably recognize that most scientists believe that uh, the overall scientific consensus underestimated how quickly the changes we were going to see from climate change were going to arrive. Well, that, yeah, when they first started talking, it was end of the 21st century. Yeah, and we're seeing things, you know, in, in related in relation to my research that were predicted for the middle of this century happening mm-hmm. now. Mm-hmm. Um, the other aspect of this is development. Um, and how much we have built into hazardous fire-prone landscapes. Um, The U.S. Forest Service a few years ago estimated that more than a third of U.S. homes across the country are in what they call the wildland urban interface, where development and communities abut flammable landscapes. That means... That's an astonishing number. I heard you say that, and and I'm blown away by that. As much of the country as is um, urbanized, fully urbanized... That number of one-third, 33% of all homes exist at that interface, that's an astonishing number. How fast did we get there? Um, We got there pretty quickly. Um, You know, we're talking about most of that development happening, you know, probably most of it this century, but certainly since, uh, you know, the 80s or 90s, you know, we've had a huge increase in building. But it's also a misunderstanding of where uh, fire can actually level that kind of destruction. Mm. Um, you know, mm-hmm. uh, I opened my talk with a photo of the Waldo Canyon fire burning into the city of Colorado Springs. That's the first time that we had seen that here mm-hmm. in Colorado, which is a forest fire that turned into an urban firestorm and destroyed hundreds of homes mm-hmm. in, in Colorado Springs. Very quickly. Very quickly in neighborhoods that uh, uh, had no idea, nobody that lived in these neighborhoods uh, considered 
considered themselves at risk for losing their homes in a forest fire. They lived in suburbia. They, you mm-hmm. know, they had mm-hmm. city services. They were on paved streets. Most of the vegetation around their houses were things they had planted there. They, you know, they lived in the city. And we saw that in, in Santa Rosa, California last year. Um, and so a lot of this is a recognition that, yeah, uh, we think in terms of uh, the WUI being, you know, people in these communities that are, that are built up into the forest. We don't think so much about the changes that we're seeing in fire behavior bringing the fires in the forest into, into the, the city. Mm-hmm. But if you look at an ember attack, which is what firefighters refer to these events mm-hmm. where you know you get a 60 mile an hour wind behind a mountain forest that is burning intensely mm-hmm. and it looks like rockets and mortar shells sure. landing in these cities and those embers can travel miles. Mm-hmm. And that means that we have uh, you know, many communities throughout the United States that are uh, at risk for having um, homes in a suburban or even an urban environment being burned down by uh, uh, burning debris from trees in a forest that may be miles away. Um, I think a wake-up call for the country actually happened uh, just about two years ago now in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Um, when I was talking about this book in New York to publishers, you know, so many editors had this attitude of, well, you know, wildfires, that's a that's kind of an that's exotic Western, Western problem. problem. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a fire that uh, that that basically burned, uh, you know, effectively in winter in Tennessee, uh, destroyed much of Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, killed mm-hmm. 12 people. Mm-hmm. And suddenly um, the East saw this wildfire problem as something that was going to spread across the country and happen in other communities, and that it was something that was really year-round. We, you know, we kind of saw wildfires also as this seasonal thing, um, that you know, uh, it, it happens in you know the summer or you know sometimes in the fall in California, but yeah. otherwise, you know, we can put away our, our our firefighting equipment and and have our firefighters furloughed in in the winter because it's really not a problem that we deal with in the winter. Uh, we've had wildfires and very devastating wildfires here in Colorado pretty much in every season of the year now. California firefighters will tell you that wildfire here is a year-round problem now. We don't have a fire season. We have a fire year. Mm. Um, and we're seeing this elsewhere in the country, mm-hmm. that we can have a devastating wildfire in almost any season of the year in most areas of the United States now. Well, so this brings up what it is that I do want to focus on in the, mm-hmm. in the remainder of our conversation together. Clearly, whether you're talking about uh, wildfire, you're talking about sea level rise, you're talking about distribution of, of uh, drought and, and storms that are stronger than they've, we've ever seen before, or certainly more a, a, a higher frequency of strong storms. All of those things point to big changes in um, uh, how our society lives on the landscape, wherever you are. And so I want to talk to you in your role as an environmental journalist, because I'm going to bet when you started your career that there was no such thing as an environmental journalist. I mean, we'd only barely had the first Earth Day, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're deputy director at the Center for Environmental Journalism. When a society is facing something this uh, large, this far-reaching, I mean, the IPCC report recently said, we can do this, but only if everybody, everybody rolls up their sleeves and gets busy. How do you see the role of journalism in helping to frame that conversation and move it forward. Um, well, I, you know, I, it, you're right. Uh, you know, back when I started in journalism, I never dreamed that there would be um, environmental journalists. Um, we were just starting to have environmental beats, you know, mm-hmm. at newspapers. And um, on one hand, uh, you know, environmental journalism is now, you know, very well established, and 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 there are hundreds and hundreds of us uh, across the United States and mm-hmm. around the world. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, you know, maybe 15 years ago, I worked um, 
connected to a team of environmental journalists, you know, five environmental journalists um, who worked on on different issues related to the environment. And, and, and the newspaper I worked at that had all these these journalists that focused on the environment hasn't had a dedicated environmental journalist probably in 10 years. Um, the hmm. fact is that, you know, while we are seeing very um, um, urgent issues that need to be covered in environmental um, in the environmental realm, um, the media world has been under uh, increasing pressure, both um, economic pressures. Uh, you know, uh, right. I, I like to point out that when I moved to Colorado, uh, there were 400 journalists working at two newspapers in Denver. They mm. competed, mm -hmm. and today only one of those newspapers is in business, and there are about 70 journalists at that. And that's a national trend. It is that, that in fact could be one of the storms that we point to that the that the nation really has to face is that uh, journalism itself is in a, in a state of flux, it, and and not just in newspapers and not just in regional or local papers. Um, this month is also, I believe, the ten year anniversary of CNN um, eliminating its uh, environment and science desk. Um, now, that's not to say they don't cover environmental issues anymore, but they do not have a team of dedicated journalists who explain scientific issues and are focused on understanding the science and, you know, producing science stories all the time. And is that strictly an economic decision for most of these media outlets, or, or is there something else at work? Is there some... There's a few things at play. Part, part of it is economics, and I guess they all tie into economics. Part of it is how fragmented our attention is as, as a society in the world of media. Um, years ago, uh, when I'd be working in New York, you know, maybe I'd be throwing elbows with another journalist from another newspaper and joking with them, you know, how we feel like we're competing mm -hmm. head to head. Or the right. journalists that worked at the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post, you mm -hmm. know, saw themselves as competing head to head. Today, I see myself as competing with American Idol and cat videos on YouTube. Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, I have to, you know, I have uh, issues that I think uh -huh. the public needs to know about, but they're policy issues. They're scientific issues. Most of the public, as soon as you mention policy or science, just glaze over, oh my God, I'm not smart enough, or this is yeah. going to be complicated, or this is going to be boring. Yeah. And that's made the importance of storytelling. You know, and story, this magical and incredibly powerful thing that the human species has to um, to, to change behaviors and to get people to pay attention. Um, by storytelling, you mean really focusing in on the human story, not, not the facts and figures so much as what it does to islanders in the Pacific, for instance, that uh, sea level is rising. Absolutely, and really good storytelling. Um, you know, humans like to hear stories about humans. Humans like to tell their own stories. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to relate to these stories. And so I like to talk about story and really good storytelling, engaging people in story is kind of the chocolate coating that you put over all those facts and figures. Mm -hmm. And as an example for that, I, I talk about this great gig I had for <clears throat> probably 10 years when I worked at the Hartford Current, where every summer, um, I would do what they called adventure journalism. And anybody that's actually an adventure journalist working in the Himalaya or something would point at me and laugh if, they, <laughs> if I was referred to as an adventure journalist. And I never really saw myself as an adventure journalist. But, you know, we hiked the Appalachian Trail. We circumnavigated Long Island Sound in a sea kayak. When I came out here mm -hmm. and fought wildfires in Colorado and Wyoming, it was one of these projects over a summer. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you were part of the team. I, the firefighting team. I was part of a, a firefighting crew. Um, the reason to tell the stories that way is that those were environmental stories. And if I wanted to get the public in Connecticut to pay attention to what was happening in Long Island mm -hmm. Sound, and I told them I'm going to tell you a story about hypoxia and how the oxygen levels have declined in Long Island Sound, and that's led to this fisheries die-off, 90% mm -hmm. of my audience would just turn the page. It's not that exciting. If, on the other hand, I do this as a guy who's you know, paddling a kayak out on Long Island Sound, I can get people to pick up the paper every day to see if I've managed to drown myself. <laughs> and if I tell the story just right, 
they have learned about hypoxia in Long Island Sound and the collapse of the fisheries and all of these issues, and they don't realize they've learned that because they're reading a story and they want to read a story. And the same thing was true when I started doing Wildfire and and the fact that Megafire, the book I've written, is very focused on science and climate and Mm -hmm. policy issues and development issues, but it's all wrapped up in story and it opens up with story and it finishes with story because you've got to get people believing that this is going to be interesting, exciting, um, uh, you know, I, I'm going to be fulfilled with story. And the facts and the figures and the data will come with that. It's kind of like making a really delicious meal. Well, you know you need these vitamins and you know you need these elements in the food and you could just hand glasses to but people it say. better taste good. <laughs> but it better taste good. <laughs> and so you want to cook a really great meal. Mm-hmm. And people, you know, you want that meal to be as nutritious as possible. But first and foremost, it's got to taste good and it's got to be enjoyable to eat. I mean, look, I'm all for storytelling. I've been a storyteller my whole life and, you know, really see the value in what you're saying. I want to ask you about a potential downside to that, though. And that is, if you're if you're spending that many column inches, just on the the experience of kayaking, um, and and really drawing people in that way, do you lose the ability to really deal with complex data sets and maybe conflicting ones? Where, I, let me phrase the question this way: If if I tug on people's heartstrings with a story about an immigrant family, for instance, crossing the desert, crossing the border in search of a better life, I can get them to see my point of view. But have I done real service to, to the complexity of the issue? Do you see that as as a tightrope that you have to walk? I do. Uh, you know, there's a real balancing act there. And you can see. Um, you know, journalism that's out there where it's just story because the story is so dramatic. Mm-hmm. And we see this in, in, in wildfire coverage. We'll see plenty of it out of California right now mm-hmm. where just telling the, the heart-wrenching story of what happened to somebody. And that's really valuable. But um, the, the real level that takes that from storytelling to being an environmental journalist is getting those complexities in there and simplifying those complexities mm-hmm. so that people can understand them. Um, one thing that um, you know we're often accused of uh, when we're a science journalist or an environment journalist is uh, well you're just dumbing it down you're just you know because you're telling a story you're yeah. just dumbing down the science or right. the complexities of these issues and um, I take a bit of umbrage to that because actually doing that well is incredibly difficult it's not dumbing it down it's actually it <laughs> takes a, a, a real real work I to take a you. complicated issue and make it palatable and understandable you know and simplify it in a way where it's still accurate but it's you know something that the general public will be able to understand quickly mm-hmm. and and in a way where it's seamless so that they are in the midst of a story and they're learning about what's happening to yeah. those people in, who, who are in this caravan traveling across Mexico, but they're also learning about the drivers of why these people are moving mm-hmm. and what's happened with the environment down there to make it so dangerous for them, or what's happening with uh, with the gangs and the violence there that is driving them to take these great risks. You know? So that puts a lot more pressure on today's journalists then. It does. It's not just the old uh, inverted pyramid model, you know, necessarily. Um, sprinkling that story in while not losing the facts um, seems to me uh, an evolution of germ- journalism. Do you would you agree with that? That we're better off for having included story and in how we deal with these things. Um, yeah, I think we're better off for that because you know we haven't really found too many other things that work. Um, when you look at climate change, well, we have had the data and the facts, enough information to know what's happening with the climate. Um, yeah, we don't have it absolutely precise, and we never will because that's the nature of science. But you know, we we can see the trends, and we've been able mm-hmm. to see the trends for decades. Yeah. And yet, the public at large has far you know hasn't really uh, moved. It hasn't moved the needle with the public at large as far mm-hmm. as their 
belief in the science of climate change. You can you know look at the trend lines of that, and we have a little increase here when we have a bad fire season, or we have a little increase here when Al Gore puts a movie out about it, mm-hmm. and then um, you know the uh, 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 people who for either contrarian reasons or because they have a dog in the fight, they have you know money to be made on having us not believe in climate change, have some time to push back against that, and then the public belief in that drops again, mm-hmm. where the trend line as far as science and scientific papers that are um, quite convincing has done nothing but increase. Yeah. Um, so we've had enough facts to uh, have public buy-in on climate change for a long time. And I think one of the failures that we had over years uh, with uh, complex environmental and science issues is that we did not include story Mm -hmm. enough. Yeah, you know, we did not tell the story well enough. We assumed, uh, as was kind of the old scientific model, that if we just produce the facts and the data, the public will add that up and make mm-hmm. the right decision. And we've learned that, that that doesn't work that way. One of the things that you learn as a journalist, day one practically, is to guard against um, the temptation to become part of the story, right? Mm-hmm. That works just fine, I think, if you're covering uh, the planning commission, sure, you know, about a development. Maybe it affects you directly, maybe it doesn't. But when you're talking about some of these big, big picture environmental issues, it affects everyone. There's not a journalist on the planet that can say they've got a completely dispassionate view of (laughs) Mm -hmm. how the climate is changing, for instance, or, or, you know, what's happening to forests around the world. In this day and age, in this environment, how do you as an environmental journalist go out there and and keep from crossing that line between journalism and activism? It's a really important question um, because, you know, as an environmental journalist, I don't get upset the way some of my colleagues do, but many do, um, when you're called an environmentalist. Now, Mm. that doesn't mean that I don't believe in environmental issues. You know, there's there's kind of a, this um, mantra in journalism that you can't be an advocate. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think it really matters what you're advocating for. I think as a journalist in the United States, you, every single one of us, should be an advocate for the protections of the First Amendment and freedom of the press. Mm-hmm. I, am, mm-hmm. I am an unabashed advocate for transparency in government. Mm-hmm. And I don't think it's a terrible thing to advocate for air that is uh, free of poisons and <laughs> water that I- I- is free of algae blooms. Or I mean, basic human rights. For yeah, basic people. human rights and health. I don't think there's a problem advocating for those things. I think where it gets to be a problem is when you start to advocate for specific remedies to problems or mm. specific courses of action. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I you know, don't mind people calling me an environmentalist as an environmental journalist, even though I try to keep those two things separate, because clearly I wouldn't be an environmental journalist if I didn't believe that providing information about the environment would help the Mm -hmm. public make better decisions about the environment to improve all of our health and safety. Um, When I work on these bigger projects, um, very often I'm writing to some degree in the first person and I'm putting myself into the book, Mm -hmm. um, into the story. Um, And to some degree that's because we've seen that that can be effective, Um, that, you know, this kind of uh, dispassionate Jack Webb, just the facts, ma'am, type of reporting. Yeah, it's literary journalism. Yeah. Um, you know, isn't quite as effective at, at at resonating on those things. But it does mean that I have to then acknowledge that, like every other human being on the planet, I have biases. Mm-hmm. Um, and my biases, like any other journalist's biases, come out in what I choose to cover. You know, the fact that I'm an environmental journalist shows that I have a bias toward mm-hmm. wanting a safe and healthy environment. Mm-hmm. Um, And so I think it's important to be honest about those things. The way I think it's really important to deal with that, and which we've struggled with in the media world as it's been pressured financially and and with bodies, is, you know, this idea that, well, if we can't be objective, if every human being is biased and uh, there's no way to separate your biases from your work, then what we have to do is create processes 
that balance out those biases. You know, the journalist can't <laughs> right. be objective, so the processes that we work in need to be objective. So, you know, we used to have a lot of editors that would say, well, have you considered this? Did you talk mm-hmm. to this person? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you get fact-checked at certain magazines, and they'll go through and find contrary science to the science that you're including, saying, well, I just read this paper, and it says this. Yeah. Maybe you should include that in it. Um, and I think those processes, while they're expensive and they've been hard to maintain, are more important than ever. So that you can say, Look, we've we've tried to consider every angle on this that we possibly can. We know that Michael Cotis has, you know, uh, advocated or or presented, you know, arguments on certain issues related to the wildfire crisis, and so we've got editors who actually look at other angles of this and push him in uh, other directions to offset his personal biases. And yet, those processes are the very thing that have largely disappeared from a lot of the news that's generated because there is no editorial board. Right. Uh, It's generated in somebody's living room uh, on their computer, and that's passing for journalism. How does the public, what tools would you recommend for the public to be able to sort through that and, and separate out what can be trusted and what really is not necessarily false, but hasn't received that stamp of, of approval having gone through that sort of rigorous process. Yeah, it's an interesting um, issue because, you know, we have this um, abundance of blogs and social media now that um, are presented as journalism, mm-hmm. and some of them are journalistic and some of them are less so. And I think that, um, unfortunately, because it's it's a hard thing to get the public to, to step up to, um, as a whole, um, but the public has more of a responsibility to sort through what's mm-hmm. actually reported journalism and what is somebody spouting out their opinion or presenting misinformation. Um, there are a variety of ways to look at, say, a blog post and see, well, did you know, right off the bat, did, did this person um, actually do any reporting? Is there, did they talk to somebody? Or, or is this are an they, opinion piece? Or is this opinion piece? Are mm-hmm. they just citing, you know, one other story and then using that to kind mm-hmm. of have a rant or or present, you know, uh, advocate a, a really strong position? Or is this somebody that's talked to a range of people, you know, or including quotes? Do are they, they link to other sources, <laughs> primary sources? Yeah, and, and what are those primary sources? Are they, uh, are they reputable sources? Are they sources that you would trust? You can look at the, at the, URLs, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, and you can kind of recognize the ones that are trying to look like abcnews.co.com or something like that. So they've created kind of a false website for, you know, a false news story to link into. Mm -hmm. Or have they done some original reporting where they're linking into primary research, scientific papers? I read this. I spoke to this person. Mm -hmm. Um, the, The foundation of great journalism is the same. Um, We have myriad ways of both reporting the news now, getting documents and information, um, uh, doing all kinds of fabulous multimedia uh, that is really uh, uh, compelling and uh, terrific as a storytelling tool, Mm -hmm. and of distributing this information via everything from tweets to blogs to, I'm assuming in the next few years, we'll have a program where you can have Walter Cronkite appear as a hologram on your desktop (laughs) and actually tell you the news. We're moving there. Um, But the foundation of great journalism is the same in all of these. You know, and I like to talk about uh, uh, the three-legged stool of great journalism, which mm-hmm. my predecessor, the the founder of the Center for Environmental Journalism, talked about. Um, and and that's you know really just three simple things, which is okay, documents. What do you have that is you know on paper or on the web that is you know a legitimate document that you can rely on? Mm-hmm. That can be scientific literature or court transcripts or mm-hmm. today emails between Scott Pruitt and the lobbyists that he was. Doing doing favors for. Yeah. Um, and then interviews. Who have you talked to? Mm-hmm. What, hu- you know, real human beings have you been face to face with? And lots of them, not just one. No, yeah, <laughs> lots of them. And, and who has guided you? Who have you gone and visited and heard mm-hmm. their real story? And then finally, and this is where um, I, I think um, journalism has really um, been able to do less uh, overall due to the finance issues, but in environmental journalism, I think it's critically important is 
the idea of bearing witness. You know, what did you go and see for yourself? You know, did you report on the wildfires in California by making a few phone calls and looking at some videos online? Or did you go and mm-hmm. see this mm-hmm. and see the destruction? When they say that the fire did this much damage, did you go and look at that damage? Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, being out there observing what's going on in the world and and bearing witness to it and seeing it for yourself taking photos taking notes doing audio recordings so that you um are really um you know boots on the ground uh witnessing what uh, our planet is going through and what these people are going through is just critically important couldn't agree more with that um you, you see a lot of uh, coverage, particularly on network style news, where you know that it's a it's a staged event, <laughs> right? And those are well, those lack credibility, they lack believability. <clears throat> We're almost out of time. I have two more questions for you, uh, and it's not fair because I think one of them could justify its own conversation. You've mentioned multimedia tools that are available now. Um, but let's talk for just a second about the ways in which um, media generation have changed. I remember watching Forrest Gump years ago, the movie, mm-hmm. uh, where the, the filmmakers did such a great job of putting him into historical situations. There he right. was with JFK. There he was, you know, marching uh, against the war and so forth. And I thought to myself, uh-oh because the day is coming where we won't be able to trust what we see. As a photojournalist, how do you wrap your head around and get and get uh, account for the fact that a lot of the photos that are out there are in fact not authentic? They are doctored, they are uh, photoshopped uh, in one way or another. And that has led to an erosion of trust in what we see. What's your answer to that as a professional photojournalist? So you mentioned Forrest Gump. I would say, you know, you want to pair that with the the Woody Allen movie Zelig, Mm -hmm. uh, which kind of does the same thing, but hints towards the, you know, the negative results, the fact that this could all be faked or somebody could, you know, be in situations that they don't deserve to be in. Um, And and then another thing that that you said, and this is not meant to be a criticism of you, is you referred to photoshopped. Mm -hmm. Well, every photo is photoshopped. Um, in, in today's right. world. And that's not meant to be, you know, like I said, it's not a yeah. criticism, but it's the way that we see this. We uh, we think of ter- in terms of, you know, if it's manipulated, it was photoshopped. But the reality is that all photos go through Photoshop anymore to get processed and prepared to sure. be distributed. And the reality is we've had manipulated photos since photography existed, um, you know, people that did cut and paste jobs that were mm-hmm. fairly clumsy, mm-hmm. or uh, you know, uh, the staged photo, which has always been a problem, where you know yep. you learn that this actually didn't really happen. They made this person do that, yep. um, you know, which is you know a, you know a violation of just the basic idea of, of photojournalism and, and, and documentary reportage. Um, the um, the real challenge here. Because you you know it, 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 the the t- the technologies have become so sophisticated that it's hard for a professional to see through them sometimes, and certainly you can't expect the general public to see through them. Mm-hmm. Is to try to create systems that can find these things and, and see through them, and to impose you know higher standards on um, on the media world, and that has been very difficult because uh, you know certain corners of the media world see any type of um, of uh, I don't want to say regulation but of filtering based on oh well we've looked through this story and you know this source doesn't exist or you know this scientific paper actually wasn't peer reviewed or mm-hmm. actually was mm-hmm. kind of fabricated as oh well you're censoring us or you're you're uh, you know you're yeah. you're violating our freedoms to, to tell our story or you're trying to you know <laughs> shut out our voices um, and, and I actually see that as more dangerous than the actual intent of manipulating a photograph Mm. to say something that wasn't true is the fact that we have a corner of the public that's to some degree being convinced that um, that efforts to impose standards on stories or photographs are actually efforts to 
uh, control the information that they're receiving, and it's part of this plot to, uh, you know, having you know uh, verifiable information, having a photograph that uh, you can run through, is, uh, you know, through a program to make sure that it's authentic, is actually uh, a, a technique of preventing them from actually getting the real truth. Oh, um, but you know, we've seen a couple of instances in the last few years, and it, it unfortunately came out of photo contests. So the World Press Photo Contest, um, you know, and, and Pictures of the Year International and the Best mm -hmm. of Photojournalism have all had instances where either um, the photo was determined to be manipulated beyond what was acceptable by photojournalistic standards and mm. awards were, were pulled back because mm. of that. Um, and uh, they have imposed rules where you have to include the raw files of the actual photograph. Oh. And it really wouldn't be hard for no. uh, media companies to say, hey, you know, we, we, we want your photographs, but you have to include a link to the actual raw file, uncropped, so that you know, we have the ability to verify or sure. even the public has the ability to verify. Well, editors have been doing that with uh, text copy for a long time. We, right. We want to know who your source are, for instance. Exactly. And, uh, so. and so being able to, you know, look at that raw file so that you can see that, that things weren't manipulated too much. But, you know, getting back to my initial point is, you know, in, in the World Press Contest, they, they pushed back against that, but then they ended up taking away an award mm. from um, a photographer, not because he had manipulated it in Photoshop, but because the photo was set up with a family member and somebody to make a point in a story and and, mm -hmm. and you kind of fell back on the same thing we hear from photojournalists and from writers that well i was getting at a higher truth yeah. um yeah. and so you know that's back to you know well we've had manipulated and set up photos yeah. all along so i think you know part of it is to uh really convince the public who can really pressure news operations that we are best served by a media that adheres to rigorous standards of verification. Which and brings us back to personal responsibility among, right. cons among consumers. Right. Responsibility to um, do that vetting themselves, know who they trust and who they don't, but also to reach out and, and put that pressure on them or input, maybe is a better word, to say this is what we want. Well, you know, one thing that we've seen uh, you know, and, and one of the, the greatest challenges, pressures on the media world, but also the greatest opportunities is that, you know, we went from being, you know, I am the media, I distribute a TV uh, segment or a newspaper to you, and you might be able to write a letter to the editor, and if mm -hmm. it meets our standards, maybe it will be one of the, you know, 1% or 2% of letters to the editor that we publish in the newspaper, mm -hmm. to now with the, the, the digital revolution where everybody can comment on stories, mm -hmm. everybody can respond to stories, link into them, and write a blog that's criticism or a support of the story. So we are yeah. much more in this position of having a dialogue with our readers than um, having, you know, being kind of this voice of God media that, he, you know, you know Walter Cronkite again, you know, and that's the way it is. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that we can use that to our advantage. Mm -hmm. You know, we can say we, we welcome this dialogue. We're going to provide you with all kinds of information that will allow you to criticize our story or to take it in a new direction. And we see that happening with, so, you know, there's a service called Document Cloud where, you know, if you have a story that you've written and you've got all kinds of documents, you can put all those documents up into this Document Cloud and rather, you know, you can just click on a link and you can go and see the original document. Right. Whereas, you know, it used to be that you would just say, you know, an email or, or this document yeah. shows this, but they wouldn't be able to see the original document, we can do the same thing with photos. Yes. You, you know, we can blow the photo up. Well, if you really want to see this, here is the raw file, or here's the entire take of the photojournalist. Yeah. All right. We're out of time, and I'm really sad to say that because I think we could talk for a long time. We and, could. Um, I'd be happy to come yeah. back. So. Well, let's do. Let's plan on that then. Um, but one last question, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask you to put this in a sentence or two. From where you stand... Um, out there, boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. Do you think that this issue of understanding the world as it actually is and moving toward being able to respond to it in meaningful ways, that, that we're moving in the right direction? Mm 
I think that we have the opportunity to move in the right direction. I think that electricity actually changed the world more than we ever knew when we first were able to put on a light bulb <laughs> because we have a vast majority of the public that see their world through the filter of media mm -hmm. that is mm -hmm. driven by electricity. So, um, you know, uh, one circumstance where that happened was reporting on wildfires where a guy didn't know that the forest beside his house was on fire until he saw it on the news because he was watching TV. Um, <laughs> and that, but that we have an opportunity to use all of these tools that we're developing all the time to not just bear witness and show that we're bearing witness to the public, but to encourage them to mm -hmm. be a part of this discussion and conversation by bearing witness themselves. Okay. You know, when we see uh, all of these opportunities for, uh, you know, crowdsourced media, we're doing a story on this, please share your, um, your photos or your experiences or tell us what you are seeing okay. um, is an opportunity to encourage our public to be boots on the ground themselves. Go see the world um, that you can see uh, for yourself and be a part of this dialogue with the media that is trying to do the big picture work. Well, here's hoping that that trend will actually produce what you, what you predict there. Uh, and that is that we can respond, not just watch the, our forests burn, but respond in meaningful ways. Yeah. Michael, thanks for the conversation. It's been awesome. It's been a pleasure, and I hope we get a chance to talk again. Let's make sure we do. Okay, thanks. Thanks for watching. Join us next week for another great conversation on Think Radio Presents Think Planet.